Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com and our study of Mark chapter 14 verses 32 through 42 titled The Battle of Gethsemane. Too often the evening prayer before the betrayal is either glossed over or misrepresented and not a lot of consideration is given to what we are about to read and learn in this message beginning in Mark chapter 14 verse 32 titled, The Battle of Gethsemane. Beginning in verse 32, let's read that. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death, Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. So this is the famous scene the night before the crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane. And... Uh, the word Gethsemane means olive press. And that's fittingly symbolic of what is taking place as Jesus is in that garden and he is spiritually being pressed. <laughs> in verse 32 it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, olive press. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. Uh, he, we, we, we will never be Jesus on this planet but he did give us example to follow. And whenever Jesus knew things were going to happen, he made extra time for prayer. And that's something that we need to grasp. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen, any of you ever seen where they believe the Garden of Gethsemane did to be? Did you get pictures of you in Gethsemane? I don't uh, remember. Pictures of the olive trees. I okay. Yeah. And that's what those are, olive trees. Um, this is what the ridiculous kind of stuff you see painted about it. There's a bunch, bunch of naked babies up in the top. And some reason Jesus is looking at them praying. How, how many of you think that might be a Catholic painting there? And here's, here's, you know, they're all... And look, instead of those beautiful olive trees, you've got a twig <laughs> sticking out of the ground there. Man, everybody, you know... We get mad at Hollywood, but these artists have always been butchering it. I mean, they've always been getting it wrong. And you just look at, look at even Michelangelo. We showed you the Last Supper. You know, they're all on one side of the table facing the camera. <laughs> he takes the three. You remember we talked about there's three in particular that he, he kind of always took off to himself. Um, you know, it's not for us to get jealous and that actually did stir some jealousy among the apostles the, because there were three that he would take off to the side. And they would then d debate and argue who was going to be the greatest and all that. And uh, you never saw that after uh, the resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The only thing you saw after that was there was a time where Paul had to rebuke Peter because Peter was being a hypocrite. So... Even, just remember that, even among the apostles there were differences. Even among their apostles there were times where Paul had to go up to somebody and rebuke them. And all that meant was he stood in front and says, Peter, what's going on, man? 
So remember that. Look around. You're, you're surrounded by humans. And it doesn't matter whether you're in this building as a church or out in your life, the believers that you know. They're human. You're going to have personality clashes. You're going to have issues. If everybody would just be content where God has called them, it would solve most of the problems in churches and among Christians. Now we're coming down to the end. He takes the three. It says, And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. Now here's where we're going to really have to understand the incarnation. Jesus Christ is God, but when He came, He came as a man. He wasn't half man and half God. He was a 100% man who was also 100% God. And you see, that's where the incarnation is a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. But that's why in, in instances like this, you see Jesus who is God, but He is responding with the normal emotions of a man. And He knows what's about to happen. He is God. And yet, He knows what's going to happen, and He is sore, amazed, and very heavy. Listen, folks, we are going to face things in life and if you think you're super spiritual, you know, you think you should walk around with a big S on your chest because you are, dun, 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 you have a spiritual problem, come to me. Well, that might work until you're the one on the hot seat. But see, what a lot of times people will get sore amazed and very heavy and then they'll think, oh, I'm not as strong as I thought I was. And you know what the response is? Amen. It's in those moments of weakness that then you realize where your strength comes from. And God gets you through it. And even while you're going through it, you may not even feel like you're going to make it. But then you do. And you realize it's God giving you the strength. It's God giving you the power. As a matter of fact, if you want spiritual maturity, get to the point that when trials hit you, you throw up the white flag to the Lord. And you say... I'm relying on you, Lord. It's all you. That's maturity. I'll be honest enough to tell you, I'm not there yet. There's so many times there's stuff's going on, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take this on, you know, and then. Psh! But at some point, I hit my knees. Okay, I've been stupid, but from now on, it's you, Lord. Amen. 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 It is not the physical brutality that causes Jesus to anguish over the cross. Do you understand that? He's sore amazed. But it's not over the fact they're going to beat Him and put the crown of thorns on His head and nail Him to a cross. The sinless Son will become sin and suffer separation from the Father. Two things He's never known. He's never known sin and He's never been separated from the Father. The mystery of the Incarnation, the mystery of the Trinity, but it's there. It's true. We can't explain it all. We can't understand it all, but it's true. It's there. Jesus will become sin. I want that to sink in. He becomes sin. All sin ever committed is laid upon Him on that cross. And he knows that's about to happen. 2 Corinthians 5.21 If you make a note. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 It says, For he hath made him, that's God the Father, he hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You will never be righteous on your own. You will never arrive and be righteous in this life. You will only be righteous because God the Father made Jesus to be sin for you on the cross. And because of that, He then conquering sin and death when He rose from the dead, He then promises you 
that if you believe in Him, though you are dead, yet shall ye live. He will raise you, and then we will become like Him. He will take this vile body and make it like unto His glorious body. He will clothe you with His righteousness, something you would never attain on your own. He will clothe you with that. And that's the only reason why heaven will be heaven. Because you and I will be like Jesus. If we all went to heaven the way we are right now, it wouldn't be heaven. It would be what we're in right now. But He's going to clothe you in His righteousness. He's going to glorify you. The moment you believe the gospel, that is a fact for you. The only thing you're doing now is waiting for that moment. It's as good as done. It's done in the eyes of God. But now you are simply waiting for that to take place. The provision has been made. We're just waiting for the appropriation. Amen. Amen. Modern materialist Americans are incapable of understanding the impact of this event because they do not appreciate the vileness of sin and the holiness of God. Today's typical materialist, fleshly, can't see past the nose on my face, it's all about me, self-esteem American. Cannot understand what we're studying today. They can't understand the impact. Number one, to them, sin isn't as serious as it is for God. And to them, God is not as holy as He really is. He's the man upstairs. He's my homeboy. God's cool. Me and, me and Jesus got our own thing going. Amen. Amen. Yo. <laughs> that's what people, that's what they think. No respect. no respect. And it's because they don't take seriously His holiness. And they don't take seriously their own sin. Once you do that, things change. Once we understand these things, we can then understand Jesus' words in verse 34. Jesus it says, and saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Me and you, man, we'll be like, I'm so hungry, I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> oh, boo hoo, you haven't eaten in what, four hours? <laughs> you know, we say that stuff and we don't. The Son of God just said that he felt like he was about to die. He's not just blowing smoke, he was sorrowful unto death. He knew what was about to happen to him. He knew he was about to become sin. He knew he was going to suffer separation from the Father. He knew this was something that the universe had never seen before and will never see again. Sorrowful unto death. Folks, that's spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare. Now this moment which, by the way, is also spoken of in Matthew 26, 39, is the only instance where Jesus fell to the ground. It says in 14:35, and he went forward a little and fell on the ground. He didn't kneel. He's not just taking a knee. Folks, I want you to get a picture of that. Jesus went forward a little and collapsed onto the ground, powerless. All this He's doing is because of me and you. All this that He's going through right here in the garden is because of sinners. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because what? God Himself in the form of Jesus Christ perished on your behalf. And he, this is before the fact. He knows what's about to happen. The only way to accurately understand this is in the light of what we call the doctrine of the Incarnation. The doctrine of the Incarnation. Verse 40, uh, 35, read that with me. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, if you don't believe in the Incarnation, you don't believe in the Trinity, that makes very little, if any, sense at all. But you have the incarnation, you have the man knowing what's about to happen, but you have the Son of God saying, 
one thing and the other. They're not contradiction. If it were possible, the hour might pass from him. But then in the next verse, read that. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Do you know what the number one and only commandment of the modern American today is? This is the commandment that we are to follow. What thou wilt. The, the commandment of the modern American today is do what thou wilt. Shall be the whole of the law. And if you, I'm telling you, you try it. You go out and talk to most people. It's all about, I do what I want to do. I'm going to do what pleases me. As long they'll even they'll, they might footnote and say, as long as I'm not hurting nobody, that's not true. They'll still hurt people. Be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. Yeah, all those are different versions of "Do what thou wilt," and you know where that come from? Aleister Crowley, Satanic Bible. The Satanic Bible is summed up in "Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law," and that's the rule of this godless society that we're surrounded by right now. But what thou wilt is our attitude. Hey, that's what the word faith, charismatic movement teaches people to pray. They, don't, they tell them, if you pray, thou will be done. That's blasphemy as far as they're concerned. You're supposed to name it and claim it and believe it and speak it. And you don't pray, thy will be done. That's what they teach. They're teaching the satanic Bible in word faith churches. Did you know that? Pride. Arrogance. They're teaching it in the schools. Self-esteem, man. It's all about you. Feel good about yourself. Jesus died for us. That's why we use the Romans 5.8 when we're sharing the gospel with people. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Unlike most of your Christian friends, God doesn't tell you to straighten up and look like me before I can be your friend and love you. God says, come to me as you are. I'll save you, and then I'll be the one to clean you up. I'll save you, and then I'll be the one to transform you. But you've got all kinds of people out there trying to transform themselves in order to be made acceptable to God. It doesn't work that way. As a matter of fact, you can't be saved when you approach God like that. You can only be saved when you approach God and say, I am going to finally be honest and admit I am wicked. Even when I do good things. I would not give money to Girl Scouts if it weren't for the cookies. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Tax write-offs. I mean charitable contributions. Yeah. Hey, that's not stupid. I mean, if you want people to give charity, most of the people have to be motivated they have to be given incentive that it's going, to ple it's going to do something for them. I've had people call. I've had people call and say, I want to give toward your ministry if I can get a tax write-off. Yeah. I've got emails like that. Uh, you know, I said, you know, God loves a cheerful giver, don't you? <laughs> Jesus willfully died for our sins. This was not against us. Even though He's praying, if it were possible, this hour passed, but He willfully died. I don't want you to get the wrong idea. That struggle going on in Gethsemane isn't that Jesus doesn't want to die for you. Jesus clearly announced His intention to die for our sakes. And we read this uh, in our Bible study this week downtown. John chapter 10 and verse uh, 17 says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because... I lay down my life that I might take it again. This was all His doing. He was willfully laying down His life to pay for your sin. And you have some of the churches who paint Jesus up as a poor martyr and you know how terrible it is that He was... No, He said, I am going to lay down my life. He told Pontius Pilate, you don't have any power over me. All power you have over me was given to you by God. Otherwise, you'd have no power. 
The next verse 18, read it with me. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's awesome. You remember when the Passion of the Christ came out and Mel Gibson, oh, it's anti-Semitic, you're blaming the Jews for killing Jesus and all that stuff is going on. They were predicting riots and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> they were hoping, wishing. That's the headlines, you know. There were some preachers, not very many, but some preachers who knew the Bible that went around saying, wait, 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 wait. First of all, the Bible says every sinner, which is every man, is the reason why Jesus died. And the Bible says Jesus Himself claimed that He laid down His own life. So why are we having this discussion? <laughs> the KKK, man, they've used that against the Jews. They said, Christ killers! That's what Hitler used against them. Christ killers! God killers! What do they call it? Deicide. Killers of God. Yeah. It, there just wasn't enough people running around preaching the Bible and telling them it's that. Well, they might have tried and Hitler killed them, but they, <laughs> dude's crazy, man. <laughs> Jesus laid down his own life. But sadly, while Jesus agonizes his closest friend's sleep, folks get used to that. That's how it goes. Amen. Verse 37, read it. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? There have been too many times where I slept through it. Too many times. Let's just be honest. But before we condemn these guys, we'd better recognize this tendency in all of us humans. Too many times. Verse 38, he says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The power to overcome a temptation is not in you. The Spirit, small s, the Spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. You try to operate in the flesh, you will fail. Just think of how gracious the Lord is to us as we fail Him so often, so many times over the years. All the cockiness and arrogance of a believer leaves with time, if they're honest. Some people get saved and all of a sudden they just immediately ready to take on the world, you know. And then they fall flat on their face and what do they do? I don't even know if I'm saved. <laughs> You're like, dude, get used to this. We're saved not by your works, you're saved by what He has done. So this isn't about salvation. Now get up, brush yourself off, and let's all grow up a little. And let's realize when we fail Him that what we ought to do then is stay on our knees for a little bit and thank Him for His grace. Thank Him for His mercy. God's not Allah. Allah is going to take sinners and cast them into hell. And if you read the Quran, there's no surah, surah in there that tells you how to be saved. Read the Bhagavad Gita. Nothing in there about how to be saved. Read the Book of Mormon, and you have to be saved, baptized, and then keep doing all the things the Mormon church tells you to do. You see, outside and apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, all other religions basically lie to you and tell you you can do something to save yourself. You can be a good enough person. It can't work. It won't happen. We, even after we're saved, fail Him. And He just keeps forgiving. And He'll keep forgiving you if you will first come to Him and say, I can't do anything. I am a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I turn to you and what you have done. And I accept what you have done for me. At that moment, you'll be saved. And at that moment, God will begin to work in you. And He'll forgive you and forgive you and forgive you. His grace is amazing. That's why we sing about it. Amen? Amen. The scene then repeats itself. So many times we repeat our fail failures 
within a matter of minutes, he repeat the whole scenario. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. The scene ends with Jesus announcing that the time has come. Verse 41, read it with me. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The time has come. The hour has come. Don't miss this. God had foretold this hour, and it had now come. We're not going to review it all, but it's Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Back in Daniel 9, we, here's the chart. You can get it online. You can hear the message. Daniel 9, 24-27. 600 years before Christ, God said, here's when the Messiah will come, and He will be cut off, but not for Himself. And that's what you're seeing in Mark 14 being fulfilled is a prophecy given six centuries before Jesus even was alive on earth. That doesn't compare to anything you'll find anywhere else, folks. Proof of God's existence. Proof that this is God's plan. Proof that God is in control. And we're going to end with this cliffhanger. In verse 41, he says, Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. A couple things in closing. Just as we already know how this turns out as we continue the story, most of you know, how the, I think all, all of you in the room know how it turns out. God has promised you and I that our story turns out with us in glory in His presence. Just as we can, know, we already know what's going to happen in this whole story, but think of this. We don't know the end of our story, but God does. And God has promised you as a believer, it turns out good turns out with us in glory in His presence. And one last little nugget to leave you with. Notice that this was not only true before the crucifixion, but is what Jesus could say to us at the rapture. That last verse, He says, Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. That's not just true at the time of the crucifixion where He is with all of His followers right there but at the rapture. Rise up and go. He that betrayeth me. You say, whoa, whoa. There's only one called the son of perdition. Look, when you see this phrase, it's the son of perdition. There's only one. That's what the Bible says. I don't care what your preachers taught you before. I don't care what schools and books say. There's only one, the son of perdition. The title, that is a title, is applied to Judas and the Antichrist. And just as Jesus said, Rise and go, lo, if the one that betrayeth me has come. It was Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said it. The son of perdition. It will be the same thing when you and I hear the voice of the archangel. The trump of God. Come up hither! The dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. Lo, rise up. Let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. You and I are going out of here right before the son of perdition shows up. Amen. Great stuff. That is a great book, amen? Be sure to visit our website at bbfohio.com to view and listen to free audio and video Bible teaching. That's bbfohio.com. On behalf of Bible Believers Fellowship, I'm Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening.